Okay, so welcome to my uh, session at uh, Tech Nation. It's called uh, uh, 700, 700 tons of code later. And uh, it is uh, about uh, those rare occasions when you can't get uh, your job done using your ID. So it will not cut it, and uh, obviously when that sharp instrument doesn't cut it, you need something else like a spoon. Who am I? Um, by day, I'm software engineer at Uber. By night, I uh, contribute to some open source projects. Overall, I'm father of two and husband of one, and not vice versa. Um, let's do this one. Can we raise it? Okay. I'm a coordinator of a Bulgarian translation project, so I make sure uh, a lot of infrastructure speaks uh, Bulgarian, which is a South Slavic language written in the Cyrillic alphabet. So, as you can say, um, I'm interested in uh, uh, transforming things while keeping their meaning, or uh, uh, having two things uh, that should uh, mean the same thing and yet finding the differences in them. If you ever need to reach me, uh, my contacts, like email, LinkedIn, SlideShare, GitHub, whatever, like I don't use TikTok. Uh, the other button. Uh, Learn and share, so um, the whole uh, um, uh, presentation is licensed, licensed uh, uh, Creative Commons attribution. Uh, code is uh, MIT, and hopefully I will uh, be contributing it back, back to the mother project uh, soon enough. Okay, so uh, most of our time we stay in our comfort zone where we know how to do things. So we know how to edit uh, uh, files. When it's a single file, we use a, a thing like a text editor or um, 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 a word processor even. Uh, but when that file gets like to two gigabytes of size or when there are way too many uh, uh, files, we need uh, some sort of uh, uh, tooling to do that, like uh, uh, SED or Perl. You can do a Python, you can uh, write your own program to do that, but still, you wouldn't do uh, um, text editing on, like, uh, let's say, 10,000 of uh, small files. Um, when there is data and it's uh, um, small enough, we put it in a common table, uh, most probably in a, a spreadsheet. And uh, as I used to say, like uh, in the past, every uh, software program grew until it gets. Uh, uh, an embedded uh, email client. Currently, I, uh, I think that every program, especially business-oriented uh, ones, grow uh, until they uh, feel the need to embed a spreadsheet in them. Uh, but uh, when we have uh, lots of data, we put them in like uh, uh, databases, and they, the databases uh, we um, uh, serve us well enough. When we explore that data, for quick, ad hoc things, we, we use an uh, interactive session. Um, when it's a, a repeating one, when um, the volume is too big, when the complexity is uh, high enough, we either uh, write something in SQL, uh, extract transform uh, job, or like some sort of script. So, based on this, like when we have a single software module, we use an ID. When we have to work on 10 modules at the same time, we still use our ID. When we get to uh, one uh, more power on top, like 100 modules, do we use an ID to uh, edit all of them at the same time? Like, really? What happens when we have uh, 700 modules and we need to edit them? refactor them, and um, it's a rare occasion when we get into that position, and when we get into that position and we need help, there are always like uh, 
three types uh, of outcomes. First, there, there is always someone uh, who will tell us, well, it's obvious, you never should uh, uh, need to edit uh, 700 modules at the, at the same time, which is not uh, kind of helpful because you already got into uh, that place. Uh, another way is like uh, cursing at uh, things like uh, your uh, CPU, uh, lack of memory at your laptop, like only 16 gigabytes. Um, um, ID is a, a frequent uh, target uh, of uh, hatred. And like uh, you can see, this is a power set. So you can curse at uh, all these things t together, or you can like curse at the empty set. So in a general sense, you hate it. And finally, you, 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 you uh, get to the point of the sad realization that uh, you still need to do the, all that work. And you have uh, three options to work in sequence. So you open the module, you do your thing, you close the module, you continue on. You can work in parallel. So you get 700 people, which is a possibility. And they open a single module, and uh, uh, then uh, they do their thing, they close, continue on. Or you decide that uh, both are like uh, theoretical in nature. You actually need uh, both sequence and parallel. And then you get to management because there needs to be someone to organize all of that. And at that point, you're kind of screwed, right? So is this all of this realistic? And uh, I think it's no longer the case. Uh, first, there is the, the rage of microservices. So uh, there are lots of them. You can um, <laughs> uh, say uh, uh, things uh, whether they're big enough, small enough, whatever, but there are always too many of them. And each one of them has uh, its own particularities. Uh, we're in a, um, in, a, uh, in a position where growth is uh, uh, very liked. So it's a, a, a major thing, so you need to grow, which means you'll get more microservices, you'll get more programmers. And on top of that, we get monorepos. They're all the rage, and uh, everybody seems keen to move to that. And uh, uh, monorepos like are just, uh, oh no, this button of the same thing we see again and again. We get uh, lots of files, we put them in a common file system. We got lots of data in a single database. We got lots of source files, we put them in a single source control, uh, uh, source code control system. We get lots of eggs, and we make sure we put them all in a single basket. So IDs are actually great. They do uh, a lot for us. Um, uh, so I believe there's ha hardly anyone uh, uh, not uh, uh, using ID here. Perhaps you are a V or MX uh, uh, fan, uh, but like they're not uh, simple text editors, right? So all of these tools work great, and uh, they do so until they don't, don't work at all. So when you try to open uh, 700 modules at the same time in your ID, most probably, if it manages to open them in two hours, it will crash. So tooling uh, is inadequate. Uh, when you have to refactor 700 modules at the same time, you can like uh, do a, a hodgepodge of uh, uh, text tools, and then uh, you're in trouble because uh, um, you can't really text process uh, uh, programs because there is a structure to that, meaning, uh, scoping, and all, all, all those uh, tricky things. You can start uh, going back to, to basics, so you'll, you can write a lexer, a parser, which is uh, uh, not fun. Like, w when you know to do it, it's not that hard, but it's, um, I don't think it's uh, ever fun. And it's still not enough because there are all uh, programs, apart from having the structure, have some meaning. And that meaning is uh, uh, captured with later tools like flow analysis, um, um, constraint analysis, you name it. And your final uh, way is like uh, use a good uh, and tested solution. And my claim is that is spoon. Right? Your ID won't cut it. You need a spoon. Spoon is a library that allows you to do those tricky things. 
a bit of history. So uh, the site where you can uh, check its documentation and uh, um, uh, download it. Development is open uh, via uh, GitHub. License is uh, open source, which is uh, MIT and uh, uh, um, Cecil C, which is basically the French uh, uh, variant of uh, uh, LGPL. It's distributed uh, via Maven, um, so obviously it's a Java thing. It has two versions, a thin and a fat uh, version. The thin is the one you are going to most uh, uh, often embed in your um, project or uh, uh, if you uh, are uh, creating libraries on top of that. However, they also provide a fat version, which is great when you do uh, scripting, so you can use that same library as an executable. Uh, it started in uh, 2005, so that's uh, some heritage there. Uh, al already at uh, 14 years. Uh, it is currently at uh, 7.4, and uh, next version will be 7.5. It's developed at INRIA and part of uh, OW2 consortium. And my, uh, my, my interest uh, uh, is like I have uh, some fondness at uh, things that uh, are developed at uh, INRIA and part of OW2. Uh, it's used both in academia, so there are uh, some papers uh, written using it, but it's also used in an industry. Okay, so the two sides of things. Actually, there are many sides of uh, things and like they're uh, never black and white. But still, using Spoon, you can do two things. You can do code analysis which means you can do static checks like uh, error prone, uh, but you can do them custom for your needs. Uh, you can get metrics on your code. You can check whether uh, um, there are some architectural constraint, uh, constraints that need to be kept. You can do code generation. Actually, uh, initially Spoon started as a type of uh, annotation processor. You can do instrumentation on top of your code, but you can do that uh, even in the source phase of your project. And you can use it as a reflection substitute. Now, when you have those two things, like code analysis and uh, code generation, you can do code transformation. You can start with code, do things on it, and still get code back. Uh, human-readable code that you can check in your source code system. And like um, um, from my uh, uh, industrial experience, like code transformation seems not uh, uh, like a common tasks, like the most common task you get, but uh, it's actually most of programming, uh, right? Like all of these refactoring, uh, when we upgrade dependencies and something, uh, a call is deprecated and we need to substitute it with something else. Replacing dependencies, uh, bug fixing, especially those uh, uh, easy type of uh, uh, bug fixes uh, that uh, uh, junior uh, programmers uh, make. Lots of maintenance is, uh, uh, um, is basically uh, some sort of code uh, transformation. And, uh, on top of that, all of these are usually quite mundane. So in order to do that transformation, Spoon presents a meta model to you. It's basically modeling the Java language inside something that runs in Java. It's sort of abstract syntax tree. We'll see an example later on. But uh, from your compiler classes, you'll know uh, ASTs are basically a, a bit on the verbose side of things. It's based on the Java language rather than the bytecode or what JVM does with this bytecode. Like uh, um, what you see when you write the code is not actually what uh, uh, gets uh, uh, generated uh, uh, when the compiler passes through that or uh, uh, when uh, uh, the JVM uh, does uh, magic things like uh, replacing uh, um, methods with intrinsics and uh, um, inlining methods and transforming things. things. So you're, what you're going to see is what you're go uh, going to write, Java language, rather than uh, 
keeping the, the peculiarities of like nested classes that have uh, synthetic members or assert statements that also will get uh, uh, synthetic uh, um, 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 fields. Covariant returns and type erasure also uh, um, need uh, additional support uh, via bytecode to uh, generate bridge methods that you don't see in your source code. That model is quite expansive. So there are lots of different things there. And uh, there is a legion of different types. And I've kept all the, uh, the, 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 the drawings very small because you don't actually need to look in every detail in there. It's enough just to, to see that there are fewer things here than there, and there are most things in here. And these are the three things that you're going to use when you use a spoon. Uh, there are references, or these are the way you name things. Roughly, uh, th this roughly corresponds to names of classes, uh, and they allow you to terminate uh, uh, and uh, uh, do fast processing. Basically, you don't need to have all the classes in your class path in order to do uh, um, transformation on top of code. Then you get structure. And the basically, structure is all your declarations inside your classes. That thing that can go outside of methods. And then you get your code, your executable code that stays inside methods. You cannot like push it outside of a method or a constructor. Inside that uh, model, everything is a CT element. And CT comes from compile time because initially uh, Spoon started uh, uh, working on top of the Java compiler and using uh, that uh, abstract syntax tree. Currently, it's a different beast, but CT state. Um, what you get is a type of DOM. And since you've all used uh, uh, different types of DOM, you can immediately see that you'll get children, parents, siblings, so you can go up, down, sideways. Uh, you can query all that structure, and you can do uh, paths inside of uh, that uh, tree. As usual, when you get a tree, uh, you get uh, to use the, the visitor pattern because it's kind of easy. And that's why everything is uh, visitable in that. In an advanced uh, setting, you'll uh, use uh, most often these uh, four types of things. Factories to produce your objects. Queries to um, uh, query different parts of that model. Processors to process. Uh, the, the model, and you get to that level once you are clear uh, of what you're going to do, and you may produce something reusable and call it processor, and you reuse it similar to an annotation processor. And uh, the nicest uh, advanced thing are templates. Basically, you can extract something that is uh, uh, Java, model it uh, in Java, and uh, uh, make sure it is both type safe, and when used back in your original source code, it will remain type safe. Having said that, let's do a realistic example. Um, it's a very simple task. You need to, to migrate a single project to a monorepo that, uh, 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 that simple task, however, is uh, made much harder because you don't have actually a single project to migrate. You have 700 projects to migrate. So on entering monorepo, you need all of your unit tests to extend a basic class that comes from that monorepo. It's a very easy thing to do when you get one module, but it's time consuming and exhausting when you're uh, at a scale of hundreds. So for every one of the modules, you introduce a common base class. 
You cannot rely in any way on the naming of the classes. So there are some things called uh, test blah blah, and they may or may not be a test. Other things called full bar tests, and they may or may not be uh, an actual test. And things that are uh, named in a random way, basically based on some things uh, uh, that uh, come from your um, bug tracking system. Because like they're real hardcore programmers that uh, whenever they uh, get uh, uh, a bug, they write a unit test and name that unit test uh, according to the name of the bug. So yeah, no uh, naming conventions. Some of the test classes already extend others, so you just can't randomly start and extend everything. And on top of that, uh, there are inner classes as well because people like them. And why not? Kind of a uh, uh, fancy thing. So in next few slides, we're going to walk through that example. We'll, the example is called Spoonerism because Spoonerism is uh, uh, obviously based on Spoon and also means uh, uh, changing, uh, um, changing meaning of sentences when you uh, uh, exchange the sounds of uh, different uh, um, uh, words. For example, instead of saying it is customary to kiss the bride, you may say it is customary to kiss the bride. So what we're going, going to do, we are going to read the classes we have. We're going to display them just to see how they look like through the lens of spoon. Then we have to enumerate testing classes, those that we are preoccupied with fixing. We need to determine uh, the base testing class package where we are going to, to place our base class that all of them uh, are going to extend. We are going to create that class. Then we are going to extend those classes that need extending. And at the end, hopefully, we will write those transformed classes. OK. Reading classes. It's kind of easy. You get your spoon universe, you create a new launcher, and you add all the inputs, input sources that you're interested in. You can add as many, t uh, as many directories or point to individual files, and uh, you don't need to specify the whole class uh, path and everything used inside of it. At the, at the end of that, you build your mo module, and you'll get some statistics back on how much uh, time you needed to build that module. Next, we're going to display what we got. And displaying is also not uh, that hard. We basically create a tree. And in order to create something based on a uh, uh, spoon, we already need to get a factory, right? And uh, the, the architectural need for that is because you can't just uh, create something like uh, uh, create a, uh, uh, an object. That object is all, uh, is all should be a part of uh, some existing tree. That's why you need that factory. And that factory uh, is uh, your uh, connection between the, the, the thing and its module. This thing, uh, which uh, you'll use at the beginning and then gradually stop using at all, is the same uh, as what you do uh, get when you uh, use the, the fat jar uh, uh, for scripting. And basically, you end up with abstract syntax tree. Like this is uh, an extremely simple test case, uh, test class, just a, a simple um, and a single uh, test method with uh, one assert. For all of this, you got this one. But fear not, you are not uh, uh, going to, 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 to need all that. Let's delve into details. Let's see which part of all of that corresponds to that assert. It's still quite a lot, but then you can see that uh, structure. You can see the different uh, 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 the, the binary operators, uh, the literals like 12 corresponding to this one, the other literal in here, and there are the left and the right uh, uh, operands of uh, multiplication. And starting from, uh, from the bottom, you can go up 
and see your whole structure. If you're adventurous, you can start it at the top as well. So we saw what we have. Now we need to enumerate our testing classes. And uh, uh, as usual, when we don't know how to do some things, we do uh, them step by step uh, based on what we know thus far. For example, this is a very simple filter. It filters on types. And uh, the type is uh, a spoon type rather than uh, a Java type. So what we're filtering out now here is classes. This filter will allow us uh, to get the classes. But it leads us to the, the direction we need. But these are all the classes. Th these are not the testing classes. Let's work a little bit more on that. That's a, a more complete a filter. It has a, a matches uh, um, uh, method that is important. And in it, what do we do? We, we make sure that it matches class. That's why we call the super method. And then we make sure that if we query that class and ask for all methods annotated with the uh, uh, org JUnit test, so that collection is not empty, which means that there is still some method annotated with the uh, org JUnit test. You can use, uh, uh, you can create that reference uh, by using uh, um, a string literal, which I recommend. You can also use uh, um, uh, directly the, the class literal, but then uh, you're letting different things mix in your code, which might be tricky at some point. So um, I recommend this one. However, there is still a problem with this code. It doesn't actually match all of our classes, our testing classes that we're interested in. For example, if we have a class that has no methods annotated with a J or J unit test, but it still extends a class that has such a method. So we need to be more thorough. And uh, that's basically um, the code, which uh, seems a lot of code, but uh, let's just delve in the important part of that. We check whether that thing is a class. If not, we bail out. We get whether uh, uh, we get the reference to the current class. We check whether there is any, anything uh, uh, annotated with a, a test uh, uh, annotation. And we do that while we walk up the inheritance chain. And that's all of it. Like, where is the last time you saw a do-while loop in production? So we got all our testing uh, classes. Now we need to, to uh, determine where to place our uh, base uh, test class. And there is uh, a lot of code now, but it's obvious, right? All of that code is doing this. We got lots of package names. And we want to pay, place our base class uh, at the top of that. So we are searching for uh, our common prefix. So now you, you uh, know what I'm doing. You'll uh, going back to, to, to that uh, uh, a long thing won't be uh, hard. The whole trick is that I'm doing it in a single pass. OK. We know where to put our base class. So now we need to create it, which is easy again. From our spoon universe, we get the factory associated with it, and we directly create the class. We know the test uh, uh, class package. We just uh, put a, a random name that we really like, base test. And we create that package.
fine. We've created that package. We, so we, 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 we have created that class. Now we must make sure that all our uh, test classes extend that class. And it's a similar, uh, in a similar fashion. We get all our testing classes. We check whether they have a super class. And as I said, uh, Spoon works with the Java model. We know that um, um, every object in Java actually has a superclass, and that's object. However, when you write your, uh, um, your code, when you know that you're uh, extending object, you're not writing this explicitly. So it is uh, enough for us to check that there is no class that we're extending. And then, if we don't uh, extend anything, we just set as a superclass our base, base testing uh, class. We've done all of this. We need to write those transformed classes, which isn't hard as well. We get the environment of that uh, Spoon universe. We set auto imports, otherwise all of our references would be with the full qualified names, and we don't actually like it. Uh, the, the compiler doesn't care, yet when we look again at that code, it should be nice. So we, uh, um, we use auto imports and use shorter names where possible. We uh, said that we want the, the, the comments. Again, the compiler doesn't care about them. But if we generate something that is uh, human, uh, uh, geared towards uh, humans, we need those uh, comments. We set where we want to output things, and we pretty print. And basically, we're done. So having uh, walked you, uh, through that example, it should be uh, possible for you to start your code transformation. If you're interested more about Spoon, I recommend these uh, sources. So there are two uh, other lectures uh, available on YouTube. They have slides, they have uh, like half an hour talks. And uh, there is another quite a long talk, but there are only slides uh, um, um, available. Or you may still be not convinced that uh, Spoon is the right thing for you. Then, in order to fork off, you have two options. Either try the uh, JDT, the Java Development Tools uh, uh, from Eclipse, or try the IntelliJ's uh, Program Structure Interface. Yet I implore you to still try with the Spoon first, uh, because it's like deeply rooted in, in Java. And it's uh, especially geared towards the practitioner rather than uh, uh, the Java practitioner rather than your full stack developer. It has roots uh, in, in, in academy, but it's also used in, in industry. Like, um, so uh, I find that, like, I trained this with, with my colleagues, so they asked me why did they choose uh, uh, these names. And um, so I recommend you check th these two papers, which are, have almost nothing to do with this uh, lecture, but yet they're quite interesting and enlightening. That's uh, London's The Next uh, 700 Programming Languages. And uh, this article, a few billion lines of code later. Um, as I told, uh, the, the, the whole thing started as spoonerism, or is it customary to cuss the bride? <laughs> you know that, right? Uber is here, Uber is hiring. Search for my, my colleague, Victoria Forelli. She's in here. And she's uh, 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 at the back. At, uh, at the end of uh, my active uh, participation in this talk, remember two things. Java source code transformation is uh, reasonably easy with the Spoon library. Like uh, uh, source code transformation are not what you usually do. But when you need to do them, 
it's already too late. And that's why they are reasonably easy with the Spoon Library. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> questions? None, yeah? How do we handle Go formatting? Code formatting. Oh, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, in here. Are you interested uh, at Uber or uh, Spoon? With Spoon, uh, when you saw here, uh, pretty print. Oh, come on. Uh, at the slide where there was a pretty print, that's just the utility method. But you can get a printer and you can program it uh, to your liking. You, there are like some ready-made uh, things that you can use. But the uh, large-scale code reformatting is uh, uh, easier, right? So you can generate your roughly uh, human-readable code with Spoon and then reformat that code with other to tools. But you can also do that with Spoon. Yeah? Others? Yes. Yes, that is possible with Spoon. You can write such uh, uh, analysis and uh, write your queries to see that uh, you're invoking such a method when there, there is a, a super class of some sort of type. This is uh, like quite doable and uh, similar to what I'm doing in this example. But you, you can, like, uh, the, the example is uh, a little bit constrained. We only walked around the structure, right? We didn't uh, check what's inside the, the methods. Uh, and uh, uh, as you remember, there was a slide with the, with the middle part, with, with the lots of different types. That's exactly the part that you're interested in. So you can go and check statements, and uh, even things like whether this statement is kind of nested in another statement, whether you call this method, but no one um, checked uh, another method or locked a resource. So this is possible. Though, uh, kind of hard to do in, in the limit of uh, 45 uh, minutes. However, one of the lectures uh, shows exactly the thing. Uh, it's not as precise as uh, you're, uh, uh, you're trying to go. They're like, uh, if uh, your uh, public method is using exposing p uh, private, uh, uh, private objects, like throw an error, which is rather, um, um, yeah, you can do that. Uh, uh, while you're developing, but it's not something you're going to do in production. But yes, you can do that. What uh, Java versions does it support? Oh. Uh, syntax additions with the lambdas and Yeah, it, it, it supports uh, up to Java 10, and there is uh, support coming for 11 things. So uh, this uh, uh, thing that uh, I showed you is basically Java 8, but that's... Uh, uh, like uh, the, the thing that is most popular currently. And I kind of want like, it to be practical. It's like, yeah, you can do that in, in Java 11, but who is doing that in production right now? <laughs> well, then making a joint. <laughs>